Hello, thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and I hope you all have not yet said goodbye to the Halloween season, because here at Why the Book Wins, I am continuing the Halloween theme for one more week, so I can discuss the most, one of the most famous, like, monster stories ever told, and that is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, published in 1818, the full title being Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. And I will be primarily comparing it to the 1994 movie, which is titled Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Frankenstein, directed by Kenneth Branagh. But I will, of course, be talking about the 1930s movies as well, because how can I not talk about them? We have Frankenstein from 1931 and The Bride of Frankenstein from 1935, both of which were directed by James Whale. And I am wearing the same top I wore last week because <laughs> this just seems so appropriate for Frankenstein, right? Like it's from that time period, it has that Halloween gothic look. And then in honor of the Boris Karloff creature, I have green nail polish and I have these earrings that look like screws or bowls. They're pretty awesome. Awesome. So I'm definitely on theme today and just super excited because Frankenstein the book is just fantastic. I absolutely love it. And then the 1930s movies are also just amazing and so iconic. And then the 1994 movie is just incredible and I absolutely loved it. So just a lot of great things to talk about today that I am very excited about. And there will be spoilers for the book as well as all of the movies in this episode. But to get right into it, this is where I usually do like a book review section, but I'm, as far as is my review of the book. I'll keep it short and just say that I love this book. I've read it multiple times. I love it each time. It gives you a lot to think about. Yes, it's written in 1818, but it is still so accessible and it's not like these dense prose that are hard to understand or like it doesn't even take time to get used to it. Like when you're reading Shakespeare, it takes a bit of time and then as you're into the story, you like adjust to the language or whatever. Whereas this one, like you don't even need an adjustment period while reading it. You can just get right into it and it's just beautifully written and it's fascinating. It's great science fiction. It's, you know, a monster story, horror story. And yeah, I just love it. And so I wanted to talk about like the different interpretations you could take from this story because that was something I was thinking about more this time around because I have read this. I read it in like 2010 and then I read it in 2019 and then I read it again the year after in 2020 and then I read it yet again here in 2022. So yeah, this time around, I was just thinking of all the different things the creature and Frankenstein and their relationship could symbolize. So to start, the creature you know, he could symbolize modern science, right? Because there were a lot of his advancements going on at this time. And Shelley's father was very big in the advancement of science. And this could be Shelley in a way like being critical of her father's beliefs and ideas and critical of the idea of relying so heavily on science. And obviously the dangers of pride and like being obsessed with seeking knowledge and more and more knowledge and never being satisfied in that obsession. And the creature, when Frankenstein was making him, the creature was supposed to be like this better version of a human like and yet he ends up being a mistake of sorts and he ends up regretting it and it ends up being this like horrible experience and so yeah so the fact that the monster the creature didn't turn out to be as beautiful and incredible as he wanted and he was instead repulsed by it you know what is that saying and then obviously you can't help but compare it to just the creation story they even reference paradise lost here which i haven't read paradise lost but i know it's about adam and eve and eden and the fall of all of that but yeah you got frankenstein who creates a living being but then he abandons him and then he is haunted and hunted by this being he created and the creature tries to understand the purpose of life and why he's even here and like I said the creature reads Paradise Lost and he says how he should relate to Adam and yet he finds he relates more to Satan and then of course there's the element of Frankenstein being a man and he is trying to create life in an unnatural way without needing a woman and then after he creates this new life he should be a father to it and yet he just abandons it and does not try to you know raise this new being he has created. Not only that, but he just like hates it <laughs> and is disgusted by it. And then this time around too, I thought about the soul, right? Because the creature presumably doesn't have a soul because he wasn't, you know, created naturally by a God. He was created by a man. And so people are often so harsh to the creature and repulsed by the creature. And you could say, you know, it has something to do with his looks, but also like maybe they can sense that he has no soul. And so maybe there's something about that, that people are just immediately not liking him and don't want to be around him because they can feel that emptiness within him. But then I also was thinking like, what if when Frankenstein created him, he inadvertently gave him part of his own soul? 
soul. So what if like he had to break his own soul in half in a sense in order to give part of it to this new being he is creating? And so then that way where they have this connection, like not only in a father, son, creator, creation way, but also potentially sharing the same soul. And even though, you know, this isn't, you know, like a Fight Club situation, spoilers for Fight Club, where the creature is a figment of his imagination and really it's just his alter ego, like this other side who is him. Like the creature is his own physical being. And yet if they share the same soul, maybe the creature is acting on behalf of Frankenstein and some of the things he does. And he's like fulfilling Frankenstein's darkest desires or something. So that is something I will get more into as we get into the story. But I just wanted to throw out these interpretations right now. And it's something we can keep in mind as I talk about the book and movie. And to talk about the 1994 movie. So Francis Ford Coppola had directed and produced Bram Stoker's Dracula. And then he was going to do Mary Shelley's Frankenstein like as a companion piece for both of these which by the way with both of those movies so both movies have the author's name in the title and Coppola said that he did that because he wanted to honor the authors but also Universal I believe had the trademark to those titles because they already used the title Frankenstein and used the title Dracula so Coppola had to change the title so he claimed it was to honor the authors but he also had to make a change because using just Frankenstein wasn't available anyway he was going to direct Frankenstein as well however he ended up passing it off to Kenneth Branagh, who was playing Victor Frankenstein. And turns out he regretted that decision because he stayed on as a producer and he and Branagh were just constantly butting heads. And then a lot of other people in the production too, like one of the script writers specifically I read, just disagreed with a lot of Branagh's decisions in making this movie. And yet Branagh just <laughs> didn't care and he just stuck to his guns and he was like, I'm gonna make the movie that way I think it should be made. And I honestly love that he didn't like bend to what other people were telling him he should do. And he made a movie that he believed in and that he could stand beside. Coppola, like for example, wanted like the first 30 minutes of this movie to be deleted. And I think it's so great to have it in there because it builds up the relationships between Frankenstein and his mother and Elizabeth. And it's just so important to have that in there. So anyway, basically I love this movie. I'm so glad Brana didn't compromise what he believed in as he made this film. And it's a fantastic adaptation in my opinion. My one critique but then even this one critique I think it doesn't bother me as much but my one critique would be that there were a couple scenes where the acting was so over dramatic that it kind of took me out of the moment because it was just too much but then I was thinking about it and I was like you know having some melodrama in there <laughs> It's fitting to the book though, because in the book, uh, Victor and the creature are just so melodramatic at times and they're so emotional and they're so overdramatic and emo. So having some scenes where things are maybe a bit overdramatic is honestly fitting to the book. So the more I thought about that, I was kind of like, you know, maybe that's not so bad after all. And the performances too are just amazing. Kenneth Branagh as Frankenstein, Helena Bonham Carter as Elizabeth, and then of course, Robert De Niro as the creature are all just amazing. And there were so many scenes that just gave me chills while I was watching this. And this movie is actually kind of like the creature <laughs> because they took different bits and pieces from different adaptations to create their own create creation for this adaptation because you know the main body comes from the book obviously but they you know took a bit here and a piece there from past Frankenstein movies so it's not fair to give this movie too much credit with some of the changes they made because some of the changes they made came from ideas from past adaptations. And there is a 1970s three hour miniseries or like three hour made for TV version. It's called uh, like Frankenstein, the true story, which is funny, they're calling it the true story, even though one, they make some big changes from book to film from what I've read. And two, there is no true story because this is a novel. But anyway, I've heard that one is really good. So I would like to watch that at some point. And whenever I do end up watching it, I will make a follow up video. I don't know if it's streaming. I haven't even looked into it, but it would be cool to watch that one. And yeah, I heard like different things I read came from that adaptation as well as of course the 1930s adaptation too. And so yeah, they just created their own monster here with the 1994 movie and it turned out fantastic. But okay, let's just get right into the story now. So in both book and movie, which again, I'm talking specifically about the 94 movie, I will not be talking about the 1930 movies until the end, those will have their own segment. But so in both book and 94 movie, we see that Victor is born into a wealthy home. And at a young age, they adopt a girl named Elizabeth, who is like his adopted sister. And in both versions, his mom does end up dying. So in the book, she dies from scarlet fever, but in the movie, she dies while giving birth to his younger brother, William. And we see in the movies, 
even more so how the death of his mom really began this obsession of bringing people back from the dead, essentially. And in the book, we see how his love for Elizabeth grows over time. But in the movie, I think they showed it even better. And we also see how his mom and Elizabeth, like his mom before she died, how she and Elizabeth would help him to remember to have fun and not take life so seriously. And he would be obsessed with studying and they were there as a way to help him to remember to have fun and not let his obsessions get the best of him. But then of course he goes away to college and he doesn't have anyone there to remind him to not take things so seriously. And he just gets so in his, in his head and so obsessed. But anyway, before in the movie, before he goes to college, he asks Elizabeth to marry him. And she says, no, like, I love you, but I need to stay here. Let's get married when you're done with college. And so they promise to be married upon his return. And that whole thing with them planning on being married wasn't in the book, as far as I recall. But the weird thing about the movie, though, is because Elizabeth is his adopted sister. They're not blood related. And yet there's like at least two times when they're in a romantic moment and they say something about being brother and sister, which is just really weird. For example, when they're saying goodbye as he goes to college, he says something like, how do a brother and sister say goodbye? And then they proceed to make out, so which is just super awkward, right? Like why bring that up at all? That's just so weird. Anyway, and in the book we learn how, and in the book and movie, we see how Victor was obsessed with certain philosophers and scientists, like Cornelius Agrippa is one that they specifically mention. And in the book, he talks about how before he went to college, he was talking to his dad about, I think it was Agrippa, showing him this book he was reading, and the dad just dismisses it and like, is like, oh, that's garbage, whatever. And then just drops it at that. And, you know, as it goes with teenagers, <laughs> when a parent disapproves of something, it just makes them want it even more. And that is what happens with Victor is he just becomes more obsessed with these ideas. And he says how, as he's reflecting back, he's like, you know, if my dad took the time to tell me why Cornelius Agrippa was like disproved and why he himself didn't follow his teachings or whatever, like if he took that moment to actually explain to him, then who knows what could have happened. And, you know, Frankenstein probably would have just dropped the whole thing and been satisfied with his father's answer and moved on. But because the father didn't take the time to actually tell him, it, he just ended up making Victor all the more obsessed. So I thought that was really interesting and a really good point too about about how like the importance of explaining to your children why you disagree with something rather than just being like, no, that's garbage, don't do it. Like instead, like explain to them why and it'll make a bigger impact on them, right? But anyway, he goes to college and he is a radical and the movie does a great job at showing him, you know, how he confronts different professors and he's getting in these arguments with them about like the whys and the hows of life and death. And in the movie, he gets to know this other professor who was also a bit of a rebel because like he himself had had these radical ideas like way in the past. And so the two of them start hanging out and he sees how this professor has like a monkey arm that he has reanimated. But when Frankenstein wants to see this professor's notes in his journal, the professor is like, no, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to tell you how I did it. You can't see my journal. Like you just need to stop and probe no further because it will only lead to danger. But then this professor ends up getting killed because he is giving out vaccines and there is like a staunch anti-vaxxer who does not want the vaccine and he ends up killing the professor. And this like anti-vaxxer is played by Robert De Niro and his character ends up being hung for killing the professor. And then this guy's body is the one Frankenstein later uses. Anyway, because the professor died, Victor gets his journal and he sees like where this professor went wrong and how he can improve on the professor's works. And so he starts going to grade and tombs and getting that guy who killed the professor. And he also gets the professor's brain to use as the creature's brain. And he starts the creation. And this is not in the book at all. Like we see, we hear mention of like these two different professors, but it's not in, like in the movie where one professor had like started his own work and trying to recreate life. And Victor just like expounded on this guy's work that was not in the book. Also in the book, we do not see him robbing graves. We do not see whose brain he used. We don't see any of that. And we also get like, no description whatsoever on how he did it. Whereas the movie actually does show like some of these scenes, like the science he was using, so to speak. And so like with electricity and everything, that was obviously something that was brought in in the 1930s movie because that's never even mentioned in the book. But the only thing that is mentioned in the book is that he did make this guy with bigger proportions. So he's like eight feet tall. And he says, as he was creating him, he thought, like the creature was going to be beautiful and he found it beautiful as he was in the process. But then once the creature comes alive and opens his eyes, Victor is like immediately <laughs> repulsed and he runs out of there. And then when he comes back, he finds the creature is gone and he's just like, oh, whew, like that was a close one. Like not my problem anymore. And I just want to share this section of the book where the creature comes alive and it reads, it was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes and my candle was nearly burnt out when by the glimmer of a half extinguished 
extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch from whom such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath, his hair was of lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with the watery eyes that seemed almost as the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health, I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and the breathless horror and disgust filled my heart." And in the movie, like I said, we do see like how he goes about creating this creature, and he has him in this like big vat of liquid with like this fluid, like embryotic fluid, I believe is what he's using. And so when the creature like comes alive, he's getting him out of this vat and then the vat tips over. And so there's just like this slime stuff that they're, cause they fell into it. And so he is trying to help the creature stand up and they're just getting this slime all over themselves and slipping everywhere, not able, not able to stand. Like I might be describing it in a funny way, but I mean, it, the scene was really well done, but it was also just so gross seeing them in this slime. And I read that they used like cooked gelatin to create this substance, but it just looks so gross. And he does eventually get the creature to stand, but then it's just a disaster and the creature gets caught in these chains and, and Frankenstein thinks that the creature just died and you know was barely alive at all. And so then from there he goes to bed. By the way, he didn't shower before he went to bed, so he was covered in that gross stuff. And then he just goes to bed and doesn't even shower. Anyway, he wakes when he hears the movement in the chains and he gets up and he sees the creature is alive and he goes to get an ax, but then by the time he gets back, the creature has taken his cloak and left. In the book as well, the creature also takes Frankenstein's cloak when he leaves, which is important because Frankenstein had his journal in that cloak pocket and it had his name on it. And that is how the creature later knows that Frankenstein is his creator. But in the book, so yeah, he comes back to his place the creature is gone and he just kind of goes back to school and lives his life as if nothing happened. And then when he's done with school, he is getting ready to return home when he receives a letter from his father saying that his younger brother William has been killed and this girl who works for them named Justine, she has been arrested for the murder because they found a locket of Williams on her and she was like delusional and not speaking clearly. And so the police found that suspicious and so they arrested her. And right away when Victor hears this, which he, you know, he goes home to see them and uh, right away he's like, wow, like the creature did this, I know it. And yet he doesn't do anything to save Justine because she is in jail for this crime. And there is a trial and he's like sitting through the trial thinking of like, you know, how terrible this is and he knows she's innocent, but what can he do? And Justine ends up being killed for this. But it's so frustrating because yeah, he doesn't even try to help her though, even though he knows she's innocent. So throughout this whole book, Victor is just so self-centered and he's only thinking of himself. You know, his loved ones die around him and yet all he thinks of is himself and it's just so frustrating. But in the movie, so before the creature even comes alive in the movie, there's a cholera epidemic happening. And so his friend, Henry Claval, Claval, Claral, who I haven't talked about, it's his friend in both book and movie, Henry and Elizabeth come to his apartment and they're like, hey, you gotta get out of here. Cholera's happening. They're gonna shut down the city for quarantine. You can't stay here. And Victor says like, no, I am gonna stay here. And so Elizabeth is like, well, if you aren't gonna come home, like, can I at least stay with you? But he says, no, she can't. And he turns her away. And so she is very upset upset and crying and she leaves. And then that night is when he brings the creature to life. And then, like I said, the creature ends up leaving. And then we see Victor, he had gotten really sick. And when he awakes, he sees that Henry is there helping nurse him back to health. And Elizabeth is also there. So they actually hadn't left the city after all, I guess. And when he awakes, he asks Henry about like this cholera epidemic and like if anybody who was out and about in the city survived. And Henry says that like, no, everybody died basically if they didn't stay indoors. And so Frankenstein is like, oh, like, thank goodness. And he thinks, that that therefore means the creature must have died because how could it have survived a cholera epidemic, right? And so as Victor is getting better, we see him enjoying his time with Elizabeth and Henry. And then we see them preparing to go back home and they're planning on getting married and they invite Henry to join them back home. So they all go back to Geneva. And as they were are preparing for the wedding, William goes missing. They find his dead body. They find, the police find Justine, the locket of Williams on her. So the police show up at the home and they tell them that they have arrested Justine. And then Frankenstein and Elizabeth go into town to the jail. And as they're there, they see this mob going to the jail and the mob 
grabs Justine and they hang her without like an official trial or anything. And so the stuff with Justine in the movie just made it more understandable why Victor didn't do anything because one, he thought the creature was dead. And two, like Justine didn't even die officially. Like it was this mob who did it. So he didn't even have a chance to help her. So this movie in general just makes Victor more likable. Cause like I said in the book, he there's so many times where he should be doing something or should not be doing something or should say something and he doesn't. And it's so frustrating. So the movie here, it's more understandable why he didn't do anything because he didn't have time and he thought the creature was dead. And so in the book, like I said, he knows the creature did this. So he goes out to find him. And by the way, this is like two to three years after the creation of the creature. So by this time, when he finally meets up with the creature, we see that he is eloquent and he can read and can write and he is quite philosophical. And he tells Victor about how he had been hiding in the woods and then he came up across this cottage and this family, it was like a blind man, his son, the son's wife and their kids. And the wife was from a different country. So they were teaching her French. And so he would like listen from the outside and that is how he learned to write and to read and to speak basically. And he also helps these people in the cottage. Like he hears that they need wood fire or they need, uh, you know, produce plucked from the garden or something. And so he will do it during the night and have it waiting at their door because he watches this family for so long. He has this connection and love for them. And one day when all of the family is out, but the blind man is home, he decides he is going to go and approach this blind man. And so he goes into the home and he tells the blind man about how like, you know, about how his situation and how everybody is disgusted by him and he has nobody in his life. But there is this one family he is going to go talk to and he hopes that they will welcome him in and he will not be so alone. And the blind man is just very kind and encouraging. But then the family, the monster, the creature can hear them walking up. And so he knows he has to hurry and say something. And so then he hurries and like grabs the blind man and he's like, you're the family I was talking about. Like, please help me. Like I, you know, I look scary, but I'm not and help me. And so when the family comes in and they see him, they just immediately like, are repulsed by him and they start hitting him and getting him out of there. And then when the creature returns to the cottage sometime later, he sees that they have gone and they have run away out of fear. And so then he burns the cottage. And then later as he's like on his way, he sees a girl drowning in a lake and he saves her. But then the father of the girl, even though he just saved his daughter, the father just sees him. And again, is like so disgusted that he shoots the creature and the creature survives the bullet wound. But you know, the experience with the cottage people and the experience with this guy just further his hatred and resentment towards the world and just make him want revenge on Frankenstein all the more. And like I said, he has Frankenstein's journal. So he knows the name Victor Frankenstein and that he is from Geneva. And the movie is similar with like uh, the creature's story where he finds the cottage people. The cottage people are teaching their daughter how to read and write. So that is how he learns. And again, he helps them and, you know, throughout the night and they like will leave him gifts because they're like, oh, the woodland spirit is helping us. And they leave him gifts and flowers. But then one day the parents are gone. And while they are gone, the landlord comes and he wants the rent money and he's very mean and he like pushes the grandfather down. And so the creature shows up and he like knocks out the landlord guy. The little girl had seen the landlord push the grandfather down. And so she had run to go tell her parents. And while she is running to tell her parents, you know, the creature helps the grandfather up and the two of them talk. And, you know, he tells the grandfather of his situation to some extent, the grandfather is very kind. But then the parents come back and the little girl had told them all she said was like, he hurt him, he hurt him. But she doesn't specify who hurt the grandfather. And so when the parents come back and they see the creature with the grandfather, they assume this is the guy who must have hurt him and they beat him and get him out of there. So again, this is another time where the movie made you more like understanding of the people that are mean to the creature because in the book, they're just mean to him because they're scared of him. Whereas in the movie, like they were under the impression that he had hurt the grandfather. So it was a bit more understandable. Anyway, the creature is very upset, but then he finds a flower they had given to the woodland spirit. And he's like, I just need to show them this flower and they'll know that I'm the one who's been helping them and that they don't need to be scared of me and they will welcome me in. But then when he goes back, they have left. And so he once again burns the cottage as he did in the book. And the creature obviously like is very violent, like he kills multiple people. And so that's like what he turns to in order to get his way or try to get his way. But also it's the whole like, I am what you say I am kind of thing because everybody thinks he's a monster. And so he acts in monstrous ways. And the whole, I am what you think I am attitude is a pretty petty way to live your life. But you know, the monster didn't have anyone guiding in him in his life, right? And so he didn't know any better because Victor wasn't there to help him. So who knows how he would have turned out had Victor been there to guide him in this life, right? But also I wanted to touch real quick about how in the movie specifically, the monster, the creature, which I'm trying not to call him a monster. I'm trying to just call him the creature. But anyway, how like he was surrounded by death at his birth because one, he's made from dead bodies, but also 
also because the cholera epidemic was happening. When he leaves Frankenstein's apartment, there's like so much death around him and he goes in an alleyway and there's these dead bodies. And so just in his birth, he was surrounded by death. I think it's just really interesting. And so then after the creature tells Frankenstein his tale, he tells Frankenstein that he wants him to make him a female companion. And he says how like, you know, even the devil had his friends and companions, whereas I am just all alone in this world. And there is a great line from both book and movie where he says, there is a love in me, the likes of which you've never seen. There is a rage in me, the likes of which should never escape. If I am not satisfied in the one, I will indulge the other. And so Victor agrees to make him a companion. And so the wedding to Elizabeth is postponed yet again. And in the movie, we see how many times Elizabeth is just cast aside as he does his experiments and fulfills his scientific endeavors. And this time he tells her like, I just need to do this one more thing. And then I promise I'll stop and we can get married. And she says how, you know, like I've had enough of your promises. You've broken like every promise you've ever made. How can I trust you? Like if you leave to go do this or if you, because he's not leaving in the movie. Movie. He's like up in the attic with his uh, laboratory. But anyway, if she's like, if you postpone the wedding to do this. Also, he's not even telling her what this is. Like he's keeping her in the dark completely. So he's being just very mysterious and secretive and he keeps postponing things and casting her aside. And so she's like, I've had it. I am leaving, like this is over. But so in the book, he does like go away to go create the female creature. But in the movie, like I said, it's just like up in the attic of their own home, it seems. So in the book, he, we see that he goes away again and he is with Henry, his friend. And like the two of them are just like sightseeing for a while and just traveling before he even gets to work. So definitely taking his time. But anyway, when he does start getting to work, he's putting the creature together and he starts to realize like, you know, the male creature, he's saying that these two are just gonna live in peace off in the wilderness and not be violent and just have themselves and be happy. But then he's like, you know, but this creature I'm making, she is going to have a mind of her own. What if she doesn't want to live that way? What if she is like disgusted by the creature too? And what if she wants nothing to do with him? Or what if she really likes him and the two of them end up procreating and have this race of inhuman monsters that are stronger than regular humans? And so he was like, either way, like, we don't know what she's capable of. We don't know what she's gonna want. And this is too dangerous. And he sees the creature looking in at him working. And as the creature watches, he like destroys what he has made so far. And the creature comes in and Frankenstein tells him like, I changed my mind, I'm not doing this. And the creature tells him like, if you don't do this, then I will be with you on your wedding night. And Frankenstein is just like, okay, fine. And so then he grabs the parts he had been using to create the female, like puts them in a bucket and then goes out in the ocean to drop it down at sea. And while he's out in the boat at sea, he like falls asleep and then his boat drifts ashore in Scotland. And then when he drifts ashore, people automatically assume that he is the killer of this guy whose body washed up during the night. And it is the body of Henry Clerval, Clerval, Clerval. I keep not knowing how to say his name. Anyway, his friend Henry has been killed. And so he goes to jail because they suspect he is the one who did it. And his father shows up and like he is delirious and he gets sick again, but his father nurses him back to health. His innocence is proven. And then the dad tells him like how he wants to see him and Elizabeth be married. And so the two go home to be finally married to Elizabeth. And when he gets back home, Elizabeth can tell like he is still not okay. But he tells her like, you know, let's just get married. And then the day after our wedding, I will tell you everything, which that's just so annoying, right? Like she's your future wife and you're not even going to tell her anything until after she's already married to you. Also, it's annoying he's making her wait. Like I have something that's so horrible and I feel terrible about it, but I can't tell you until the day after we're married. Like tell me now, don't make me wait. Also Victor in the book, he's like those people that are like, oh man, like my life is so hard. I'm going through such a hard time right now. But then when you ask them like, oh, like what's happening? They're like, I can't talk about it. <laughs> like it's so frustrating. And then the creature tells him like, I'll be with you on your wedding night. And the wedding night involves two people, right? But he's just so self-obsessed that he's like, oh, the creature must mean he's gonna threaten my life because everything is all about me. <laughs> and so he's not even concerned about Elizabeth's safety. He's like, oh, me is who the creature wants. But of course, you know, after they're married, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is up in their room and he's like, I'll be right up. And so he's like waiting in the lobby or something. And then he hears a scream. And of course the creature had killed Elizabeth. He goes up there, he sees the creature. And then he like chases after the creature and they end up in the Arctic. And as he is like gaining on the creature, he collapses from fatigue and he is found by this Arctic explorer, Walton. And Walton is who he is telling his story to. But moving on to the movie, like I said, in the movie, he has that fight with, with Elizabeth. And so she is preparing to leave. And while she's preparing to leave, he is in the attic or wherever. And the creature brings just 
Justine's body is the body he wants to be used for this new creature. And Victor is just like horrified. And he's like, no, I'm not doing that. And so he tells him that he takes everything back and he's not going to do this. And so the creature is like strangling him and he's like, go ahead and kill me. I'm not doing it. And so the creature is like, okay, well, fine. I'm not going to kill you. But if you don't do this for me, I'll be with you on your wedding night. And so Victor goes to see Elizabeth because she has not yet left. And he like begs her forgiveness and she forgives him. And she's like, you know what? Let's get married today. And then tomorrow you can just tell me whatever it is that has been bothering you for all this time. And so this, again, <laughs> making the characters more understandable and more Victor more likable in the movie because in the book it was his idea to wait to tell her whereas in the movie it's Elizabeth and she's the one being like you can tell me tomorrow but today let's just get married and also after their marriage he tells the whole estate like hey look out for this like huge disfigured man because he is the one who killed William like he is the one we are after he is threatening our life like everybody be on guard and be on the lookout which again like why did he not do that in the book right like it's not like he had to tell everybody like it's this creature I created like just tell them like this huge disfigured man or whatever is after me. That's all he had to say, but he never does in the book. Also in the movie, uh, like Henry kind of knows what his experience experiments had been all about because he was also friends with that radical professor. And so in the book, like, you know, Victor didn't tell anybody what was going on and no one knew. Whereas in the movie, you had that professor who ended up dying, but you also have Clerval who like kind of knows what's going on. Anyway, despite having all these guards around the house, you know, he's in the room with Elizabeth, he hears something, he leaves to go check, then he sees the window open in the room he was just in, meaning that the creature is there was with Elizabeth. So he runs back into the room, but he arrives in time just to see the creature kill Elizabeth by taking her heart. And so Victor in the movie, he is just in so much anguish over the death of Elizabeth. And again, just like going back to when his mom died about how like he doesn't come to terms with death and he just can't accept that someone he loves so much could be dead. And Henry sees him take Elizabeth's body up to the attic and Henry is like, you know, like I said, he was aware of what Victor was doing. So he's like, what are you doing? Like, stop it, don't do this. But Victor just doesn't care and he goes up there anyway. And so he uses a combination of both Justine as well as Elizabeth to bring her back and then he dresses her and then he is dancing with her because she comes back to life and so he's dancing with her as a way to get her to remember who she is and the relationship and the love that they had but then while they're dancing the creature shows up and he's like wow she's beautiful he did a great job but Victor's like I didn't make her for you like her, she's for me and so the creature is calling to Elizabeth and Victor is calling to Elizabeth and she's kind of in between and then she ends up going to the creature and as she is looking at the creature's stitches and things she realizes that she has stitches and she suddenly is like horrified. And so then while she's like dealing with this and horrified, Victor and the creature are like fighting over her. And then she like runs away and is yelling. And then she ends up like getting a lamp, getting herself on fire and just setting the whole estate on fire and she dies. But Victor and the creature escape. And it's the same as in the book where, you know, they chase each other into the Arctic. And then while in the Arctic, Frankenstein comes across this Arctic explorer named Walton and he tells Walton his story. But the scenes with Elizabeth, with her death and her, you know, reanimation were just so good in the movie. And it just really highlights just like the madness of Frankenstein and how his inability to accept death as part of life, he ends up creating just the, like this grotesque nightmare situation, right? And so it's just a fantastic scene. But the ending, so in the end of the book and movie, after Victor, t Victor tells Walton his story, in the movie, he dies like right away. In the movie, he's alive for a, or in the book, he's alive for a few more days and then eventually he dies. But also at the start of the book, we begin with this Arctic explorer writing to his sister and he's writing about how he wants a male companion, a male friendship, because all the sailors on board are just like too dumb and not like up to his standards. And so he's like, oh, I wish I had like an educated person to be friends with. And so when Victor shows up, like he sees a kindred soul and both of them are obsessed you know he's obsessed with like discovering these uncharted areas and then Victor of course had been obsessed with his thing and so it's just funny I mean the parallel is interesting where we have another character who is lonely and wanting companionship but it's also funny because like Walton was pretty uh pretentious being like Ugh, these sailors are too dumb for me <laughs> like I want a smart person to talk to but anyway after Frankenstein dies in both book and movie they go to the cabin and they see the creature like crying over the death of Frankenstein and he says how 
how, you know, even though he was tormenting Frankenstein, like it was his father slash creator. And so now he feels like his life has no purpose now that Frankenstein is dead. And in the movie, they build like this burial mound for Frankenstein. And so when the, the creature burns the burial mound as well as himself, and so he dies as well. In the book, he tells Walton that he is going to go and like kill himself essentially, but we don't actually see it. We just see him leaving and that's the end. And in the book and movie, we see how Walton was similar to Victor in his obsession, like I said, because he wants to achieve his goals regardless of the cost. And realizing the dangers of this obsession and this pride, he decides that he is going to turn back because like their lives were all at stake, but he didn't care. And so after the ordeal with Frankenstein and the creature, he decides he is going to go back home and, you know, not let his obsession get the best of him. And I thought this was better shown in the movie because in the movie, when Victor shows up, he hears the other crewmen, the other sailors, is threatening mutiny because their lives are at stake if they continue. But the captain, Walton, he's like, hey, I don't care how many people have to die. I am doing this. And Victor is like, you know, you share my same obsession, don't you? And this is when he tells him his story. Whereas in the book, talk of mutiny happens like after Victor tells his story and Victor hears them saying how, you know, they want to turn around. And then Victor like gives a speech about how like not giving up on your goals and they should continue on, which it was like, wait, what? <laughs> but then when Victor dies, he tells Walton about like pursuing simple happiness and not letting your ambitions get the best of you. It's like, but earlier you were telling him he should continue and he shouldn't turn around. Anyway, basically in the end, in both versions, Walton does turn around and go back home. And so earlier I talked about, you know, the creature and Victor having this connection, like pot potentially sharing a soul, which means like the creature is like part Frankenstein and how therefore, you know, the creature isn't totally acting on his own accord. Instead, he is acting on like this internal feeling he has based on what Victor wants, if that makes sense. But could, because you could say that you know, William, the younger brother is the first one to go. And you could say that Victor was probably jealous of William, right? He was the younger brother. Maybe he was the favored child. And so Victor was jealous. And then he frames Justine so that he can get away with it. And then Henry Claval is killed in the book, not the movie. Henry, you could say, is maybe like an annoying friend who just seems to have it all and everything is going great for him. So again, maybe out of jealousy and anger, he wants Henry gone. And then Elizabeth is killed and you could say that, you know, his future wife, you know, she was always so forgiving and she was just so pure. And so maybe being around her as well as knowing that he has to eventually tell her. So maybe to avoid telling her, but also to avoid feeling the guilt he feels when he's around her, maybe he wants her gone too. And in both book and movie, the father dies because the stress of everything. And and in the book, again, you know, maybe he felt like he could never live up to his father's expectations. And so maybe he just wanted him gone as well. And those are all specifically to the book. But also like in the book, the creature and Victor are both like, have like martyr complex because both of them like are competing on who's suffering more and they each cause each other so much suffering. And it's like they're wallowing in this and almost enjoying it, not enjoying it, but I don't know. It's like they're bragging about like who is suffering more. And so if Victor likes to suffer because it gives him this weird sense of superiority, like no one can understand what I'm going through. And so is it like some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that he creates this creature that causes him to suffer in a way that no one else can understand. But also I wanted to talk about like the added title to this book because it is called Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And so Prometheus is best known for defying the gods by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge, and more generally civilization. In some versions of the myth, he is also credited with the creation of humanity from clay. Prometheus is known for his intelligence and for being a champion of humankind and is generally seen as the author of human arts and sciences. So Prometheus created life and is helping humans basically, right? And so that is what Frankenstein is doing, creating his own life. But also in the myth of Prometheus, he is punished for what he has done. And so like the story goes where he's like tied to a tree and an eagle eats his liver, but then his liver grows overnight. And so the eagle comes back the next day and it's just like this eternal cycle of suffering Prometheus is in, which as I was just saying, Victor <laughs> seems to like relish his suffering, which again is parallels to Prometheus. The punishment, the eternal punishment he goes through for creating life. And this is a longer episode, but it is time now to move to the 1930s movies. When people think of the story of Frankenstein, the majority of the time they think of the green creature with the square head and the bolts in his neck. And they think of Frankenstein digging up the graves with his like weird, creepy assistant, which in the book, there was no assistant. And of course yelling, it's alive, it's alive as lightning and thunder strike. And none of this 
is in the book. This is all unique to the 1930s movie. And so even though it's not like a faithful adaptation, I really enjoyed both of these movies and they just kind of made their own thing of this story. So even though it's not very true to the book, I just still really enjoy both of these movies. In the first movie, it seems like the creature dies in the end when he like the windmill is burnt up and we see Frankenstein lives though. He's like recuperating from the whole experience. But then they made the sequel in 1935. And so at the start of that movie, we see that the creature actually had escaped from the windmill. And the second movie is actually more similar to the book, like Frankenstein, not Frankenstein. The creature speaks in the second movie, whereas in the first movie, like he just grunts the whole time. And we also have the interaction with the blind man in the second movie. And in this version, like the blind man doesn't have any family and he's all alone and the creature approaches him and the blind man is just like so happy to now have a friend. And so the two of them just hit it off right away basically. And the blind man helps him learn how to speak. And then they're like smoking cigars together and eating. And like, I loved <laughs> these moments with the two of them together. And also there's a touching scene where the blind man says a prayer, like thanking God for sending him a friend because he had been so lonely all alone in this cottage. But yeah, like, can we just get like a side movie, <laughs> a side sequel where we just see the creature and this blind man as like roommates slash best friends because I was loving their scenes together. And the second movie also has a second scientist who shows up and he reaches out to Frankenstein being like, hey, I heard what you did. I'm really into it. I want to help you. And so this guy is like even more crazy and unstable and evil. But Frankenstein kind of helps him anyway and to create the bride of Frankenstein, a female version. And so they do create the Bride of Frankenstein, which it's funny because she is only in for like the last five minutes of the movie and yet she herself has just become so iconic. But anyway, as soon as she's created, she like does not like the creature, does not want to be around him. And so the creature ends up like burning the laboratory and being like, we belong, we belong dead. And so then the two creatures die as well as the crazy scientist, but Frankenstein escapes. The first movie also, by the way, has the part where, you know, in the book, there's a scene where the girl is drowning, but then the monster state saves her. In this movie, he meets a little girl and she is friendly to him right away. And she's like throwing flower petals in the water. And so he, so he starts throwing flower petals as well, but then he runs out of flower petals and he ends up throwing her in the water because he doesn't realize that she can't survive that. And then he kind of freaks out and leaves. And so meanwhile, Frankenstein is getting getting ready to be married to Elizabeth in the town. And the father of this little girl gets her and he like carries her through the town being like, look what's happened. And so the, I was kind of surprised, like for 1931, like that was a pretty uh, dramatic scene, which caught me off guard. I do love though, just the combination of both of these movies together. And Colin Clive is playing Frankenstein in both. And he actually struggled with alcoholism. And by the time they made Brian Bride of Frankenstein four years later, he was in pretty bad shape. But director James Whale was like, no, like we have to have him. Like, I don't care if he's difficult to work with or whatever. Like I want him because he just had that like unhinged maniacal whatever to him, which I mean, can you imagine anybody else saying those iconic lines, right? Like he just does it so well in that first movie. Hey, And then of course, Boris Karloff is fantastic as the monster, the creature. He has more to do, I would say in the second movie, because at least he's speaking, but you know, he's fantastic in both. By the way, he was only 5'11", and yet he, you know, obviously he's wearing like platform shoes, but I was surprised that he wasn't as tall as I thought. And Colin Clive, who plays Frankenstein, was actually taller than Karloff. I will say the second movie, like they reference the first movie and they kind of beat you over the head with like the moral of the story, like as if they had to show like, you know, it's not just a monster movie, like there's a moral, like you shouldn't play God. Like that's the moral of the story. And they just kind of beat you over the head with it. And also I thought it was interesting that both of the Frankenstein movies take place like in modern day, which at the time modern day was in the thirties, when of course the book takes place in the 1700s, as does the 1994 movie. Time to wrap it up and do a book verse movie. So I love all of these. Like I said, the 1930s adaptations aren't good adaptations, but they are just so iconic. And I just really enjoyed watching them too, even just as their own thing, not trying to nitpick how 
it's different from the book because it was different from the book in so many ways. So I didn't really care about the differences. I just enjoyed the movies for what they were. But when it comes to the 94 movie or the book, I am almost tempted to say the movie wins because like I said, they made some changes that I preferred. They gave Elizabeth more time and she was more fleshed out because in the book, like she, there wasn't much to her character for the most part. And then I liked that they made Victor more likable and more sympathetic. They just really captured his insanity though of, as well. And just like the horror of what he was doing. And then the creature, Robert De Niro as the creature was fantastic at just like showing his rage, but also his despair. And you were sympathetic towards him as well, despite these horrible things he was doing. And I like that they have the creature learning how to speak and being very eloquent like he was in the book. And this made me think of Blade Runner because in both Blade Runner and Frankenstein, we have this like man-made thing, creature that is trying to understand the meaning of life and what their existence is there for. And they want to meet their maker to understand themselves better. But the book is amazing though. And I feel like it's like almost wrong to pick the movie over the book in this sense, since it is the source for one, but it's also just, yeah, it's so incredible. And like I said, it was from 1818 and yet it is just as popular, if not more popular today than it was then. And so just the impact it has had on our society is just incredible. And that was of course helped by the movies, but still. Also Mary Shelley, she was only 19 when she wrote this book, like, which is insane. <laughs> like I honestly can't believe that. Which also side note, when she wrote this, she had already experienced one miscarriage, which is really sad, but it is interesting how like this book is about creating life in a scientific manner but you know and she had already had this tragic experience with her pregnancy but fantastic book fantastic movies comment down below your thoughts let me know if you have seen these movies and what you thought of them if you have read the book what you think about it what do you think of my interpretations that i talked about and what do you think is the symbolism of this book or maybe is there symbolism or is it just a great story right anyway thank you for watching don't forget to like and subscribe give my podcast a rating and review happy belated halloween and I will see you next time. Bye.